We have specific time points that there are illnesses that are hormone related, PMS, PMDD, perimenopausal depression, and late onset borderline, which I've alluded to, psychosis, relapse, and depression in the pill. So again, just to go through, I won't go through all of this, but depressive disorders and estrogen treatments, the contraceptive pill, while it has been a particularly important um, uh, control of uh, reproductivity for women and has allowed a whole range of other life um, styles to continue, it is important for us as psychiatrists to remember that in fact there are contraceptive negative impacts on the brain. So many times um, we've seen young women who come with depression and have not had any other changes in their life, particularly there's nothing untoward going on. And she will say things like, it was only when I started this particular brand of pill that things started to fall apart, but I can't get people to understand that this is what's going on. I can't get my doctor to understand that. One of the worst um, or highest propensity for side effects uh, in um, this age group and with this particular causality seems to be the implanon, which is the straw that is uh, implanted progesterone. And we've seen some profound depression, which, which we, you know, you can treat by removing it. In fact, we remove it in the clinic um, and discuss other methods of contraception and her mood state improves within a week. So um, it's, a, it's an issue, not for all women. And then people go, well, you know, so many women use, use Implanon and there's no problem at all because the hormone sensitivity is an individual uh, aspect. So some women can have massive hormonal upheavals as we see in the IVF area and have no particular mental state changes. Whereas other women can have just minor changes and be very sensitive to it. And we do realize that there are women who are very sensitive to their hormonal milieu. And in that group, certainly we've got to be very careful with which oral contraceptives we use. So this is our pill study. Um, and just to get to the bottom line of that, basically uh, the users of the 20 micrograms of estradiol, that's the low dose pills, low dose estrogen pills, were more associated with depression than the standard, which is 30, or the higher dose pills, such as Clara, which have 50. So if you've got a patient who's a bit vulnerable to depression, uh, my suggestion would be to use um, Zoli, which we like because it has uh, a more natural uh, estradiol and a better form of progesterone. Stay away from the low dose estradiol pills and also stay away from Yaz and Yasmin. Yaz and Yasmin seem to have, with the drospirinone, which is the progesterone component, it seems to create much more of an angry um, uh, response. So again, if you're seeing that with your patient, it is, it is important to change the type of pill. Um, and, and some of this is actually just about listening to the patient who's probably got it right anyway. So we do hope that we'll be able to give you some more information on that as that study details come out. Now, um, do you want me to finish up in about five minutes? Yeah. Okay. I won't have time to go through all of the different bits and I knew I wouldn't, but I've given you the handouts because I wanted to make it um, clear that there are many hormonal um, triggers for various depressions and pre-menstrual pre dysphoric disorder is in the DSM-5. It doesn't necessarily, and although the criteria in the DSM-5 will tell you it has to be in the week before menses, if your patient is telling you that every cycle there is a downtime in her depression, that she's worse, then take that at face value that she has got a hormonal component to it. It does not actually always have to follow exactly one week before menses occur. Um, we use the OCP, the Zoli, as I've mentioned, continuously. Uh, so that means we ask the woman to take the pill for two or three cycles without the sugar tablets. And um, sometimes that's not enough and we add some estradiol with transdermal. I work with uh, two endocrinologists in the clinic, so you know we'll kick this around and, and do this between us. Second line treatments, SSRIs, but use the short half-life life SSRIs, you know, the less agitating ones, such as Cytelecram and Sutraline, Agamelatine is another one I'm aware of our hosts, um, sponsors. 
you can test with the pharmacogenomic testing, which I know you had a session on, to actually make sure you've got um, sensitivity and reactivity to the medication. The third line treatments are SSRI plus estradiol, SSRI plus aldosterone, and the fourth line treatments are where it's getting really heavy and you're actually trying to cause a chemical menopause. And that's where everything else has failed. And we've, ha we've had a couple of patients where it's been awful for them. Their life has just been terrible. And they've actually um, done really well with uh, chemical menopause, where it's um, using a GnRH agonist drug and then some ADBAC estradiol. Um, the drugs that we like in women are the ones that are short-acting, short half-life short half SSRIs because of the lack of agitation. The agitation in, um, so caused by fluoxetine, for example, in the hormonal situation is the worst thing that you, you would want to do for the patient who's already agitated. So we want um, medications that are um, less agitating and agamelatine is useful in women as is vortioxetine. Postmenopausally, SNRIs do have more efficacy, um, but you also have to watch out for the agitation there as well. And I just want to briefly, I won't show you that, but I just want to talk about the symptoms of perimenopausal depression. Perimenopausal depression occurs, six, there's an 16 times increase in the rate of depression in perimenopause, which starts at 45 or 43 onwards. The brain changes, the CNS hormonal changes occur well before the body changes of menopause. And this is the tricky part, because you can pick up that this is a patient, a middle-aged woman who comes who says, you know, the depression is de novo, or she's got depression that was managed well and now suddenly relapses. Think about the menopause, perimenopause, sorry, as the, uh, as the trigger. So there are a number of uh, uh, situations in which we miss this because we're all waiting for the hot flushes and the amenorrhea, which are a, a signal. And you can be clever in retrospect, but it'd be better to try and prevent a whole range of disasters occurring, which includes that the patient gets put on three or four different medications, and then you're, you're chasing your tail, trying to undo the side effects of the different medications. And meanwhile, her quality of life has just gone down the tube. So the symptoms of perimenopause include the hot flushes, feeling sad and hopeless and despairing, feeling grumpy and irritable. And this is not, a, this is not an endearing symptom. So um, the grumpy old woman is often seen as the, the menopausal symptom uh, woman. No or decreased libido, which obviously plays havoc in relationships. Poor self-esteem, especially about appearance. And the, the other one is obviously weight gain. The average weight gain in menopause is between um, three to eight kilos. So it's inevitable that there is some weight gain and there is a change in body shape and many women really don't deal with this very well at all. And so you have a whole bunch of crazy dieting that goes on. And of course, you know, when you get poor fueling of the brain, you can increase the depression as well. Concentration issues, memory problems, many women saying, am I dementing? Um, and that is, a, is, is something that we worry about in the, in, in the female population who are now probably in the peak of their career. They're probably, you know, we see many women who are CEOs of organizations. They're mothers of adolescent children. So, you know, it's a peak time in, in the community in terms of the roles that this woman has. Menopause is easy. After you stop laying eggs, they eat you. <laughs> Bit grim. So that's just to say, you know, the number of um, symptoms. I have developed a questionnaire called the MenOD to try and detect depression in menopause. Um, because it can be hard to actually s de determine what's a standard depression symptom and what's a menopause depression. But if we're going to manage this properly, we need to think about which direction do you go, antidepressants or HRT? It depends on which professional you are. If you're a general practitioner, you're probably happy to go with HRT. If you're a psychiatrist, you'll go down the antidepressant pathway. Sleep regulation is really important. Many women will use many natural medicines and um, psychotherapy is obviously important, but we need to know about the natural therapies. There are some very good guidelines. My friend Leslie Braun wrote this one, which is herbs and natural supplements. It's like the MIMS of all of those um, products out there that have a million ingredients that we are not trained in, but we do need to know about it. And I pr always prefer that our, our women tell us, what are you taking? Because we can work with that. 
if you start to sound like, you know, oh, what's all that hooey that you're taking, you won't get told that there's a whole bunch of DHEA uh, extract or other things going on, and that can create enormous complications. So I'm going to close very soon, but um, the other point is that I mentioned earlier the depression relapse can be difficult to treat in perimenopause with straight antidepressants. So do think about the hormone treatments. And watch this, which is the late onset borderline. Again, um, I don't have time to go into this, but it's pretty much the same as the recrudescence of the symptoms of self-harm, um, poor self-esteem that really uh, reaches a crescendo, and uh, difficulties in terms of maintaining a quality of life. And your role will be to, again, diagnose this, but manage this particularly with psychotherapy, but also treat any depression that's clouding the, the picture as well. Sorry, I've, I, didn't, I have gone over time, but um, I'll leave it there. And you've got lots of um, notes that hopefully you can read up. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi, hi Jay Shuri. Um, I, oh, hello, Michael. Yeah, how are you going? Um, so I sent you a patient uh, once. Or, no, I think she came to you before I even saw her. Um, and she was bipolar disorder, uh, query, uh, you know, the polycystic syndrome. But I noticed you put her on uh, this estrogen uh, called Tibolone. Yeah. And she was in the peri postmenopausal uh, phase. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, the, um, once there was all the WHI scare, um, and again, I have to say a lot of that has been rescinded, so the TGA, our TGA has now sort of taken back all of the scare stuff, but there was then a, a, a whole lot of other second um, type line of HRTs, and Tibolone was one of those. We're actually doing an NHMRC funded study to look at Tibolone in depression. It is a, an interesting second line HRT. I think it's a softer sort of HRT. It doesn't seem to have the same rapid onset. Um, it's a yam based derivative, but it actually has a little bit of sort of estrogenic compound, a little bit of a progestogenic and a little bit of a testosterone compound. All three of those hormones um, obviously fluctuate and diminish in the perimenopause. So that's why we um, it probably instituted her, I would imagine she was perimenopausal. And it's trying to stabilize. You've got up down fluctuations in mood because of the bipolar, but then you can also have up down fluctuations because of the menopause. So the strategy there would be to try and control the fluctuations in the hormonal side of swings at least, to see if then the, 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 the mood swings would settle. So um, sometimes we start with that because it's easy for the patients, it's just a one we start with actually half a tablet and move up to one tablet. Um, and if that doesn't actually do the trick, then we probably move to transdermal estradiol, which is a much more potent estrogenic compound.